Several years had been devoted to the military's eradication of the last remaining xenomorph hives on Earth. During this operation, the specimens left behind had been put to pharmaceutical use in development of groundbreaking new drugs, readily available just in time for mankind's reclamation of the planet. While no longer occupying Earth, a threat and possible opportunity remains on a far-off world, the home of the xenomorph creatures. A world which has suffered and become divided in the aftermath of the Mother Queen Xenomorph's death. On Earth, an international effort is made to obliterate the memory of the alien plague that once threatened man's existence. In Baghdad, the Goodwill Games are a symbol of that effort. Now that the Olympics had been destroyed along with much of Old Earth, you had to start with something, after all. Something to unite people, something to celebrate the new humanity, something to take civilized minds off the savage past. A sweeter conflict among nations. A good-natured competition among athletes. The stadium was a spectacular tribute to the reconstruction of Earth, a wonder spawn of new technology and architecture. Lots of companies had tossed in contributions to build the thing, and not just Democrats. Big coin. A tubular confluence of lines and efficiency, of new and mighty alloys centered around a traditional field. Wedding of the new and the old. Blimps and Zeppelin-like hovercars hung in the sky, bursting with tracking devices and media sensor arrays. Field Humanitas was the name, and these competitions in which Jack Oriander participated had been dubbed the Goodwill Games. Jack Oriander could feel the demand for it throbbing in his sinews, pulsing in his veins. He could feel the need in the stadium crowd outside, the impatient stamping of their feet, their calls, and their applause. The tension in the air was thick. Jack's nerves seemed to stretch as tight as violin strings. He knew that if he was going to get some help, he'd have to get it now. Around his waist was a light, flesh-colored belt of synthetic material. Jack devalcroed a pouch, pulled out a small bottle. He cracked open the safety seal and knocked out a pill. Hell, why not? He rattled one into his palm, then quickly screwed the top back on and stuffed it back into the pouch, readjusted his oversized shirt, tucking it into the elasticized top of his shorts. He looked down at the capsule. It was a deep green, seemingly embedded with silver sparkles. Xeno Zip. Street name, Fire. From Neo Farm. Great stuff. He'd been taking fire ever since it first came out. He'd asked the coach about it, and the guy had taken a few seconds to read the label. All natural ingredients. That was okay with the coach, just as long as there weren't any steroids in the mix. Besides, it wasn't any worse than a couple of extra cups of coffee in the morning. That's what the ads implied, anyway. He hadn't looked into it very closely. Jack immediately noticed that not only was he more alert and self-confident after swallowing one, his athletic abilities improved. Concentration, agility, coordination, all jumped into higher levels. Not only that, he felt better. Fire gave a little more zing, a little more oomph. The official line was that they made this stuff from the Alien Queen Mother Royal Jelly. Rumor had it they used ground-up alien bodies from the war. Jack didn't care. He liked the stuff. The glow that it put on life's horizons were just the icing. What Jack liked was the edge it gave him in sports. Jack waited for the glow to start, listening to the sounds outside, peeking into the light, shading his eyes. Yo, Oreo, you want to get your ass out here, called Fred Staten. Staten was the other guy from the States. He approached Oriander. Hey, time to line up. Huh? Oh, yeah, okay. Hey man, you okay? Sure. Why? I don't know. Your eyes, they're a little odd. This sun, it's kind of getting to me. That's why I'm staying in the shade as long as possible. I'll be fine. Just give me a sec. Sure, but seconds aren't mine to give, and those officials are coiling up their guns. He slapped his friend on the shoulder. You'll be fine. Take a deep breath. You're only a few feet away from a hundred yards. He snapped his fingers. It'll be all over like that and we'll go out and celebrate, huh? Yeah, right, Jack grinned. Fred was right. He should move on out. He could see the milling racers not just lining up, but slotting themselves in their starting posts. Yet the sun was not only hot, it looked terribly bright now. Much too bright. Fire had never sharpened his vision up this much before. He felt like he had just been blessed with telescopic sight. Such incredible detail. Squaring his shoulders, pushing back the razory feeling along his spine, Jack Oriander trotted out to assume his position. 
A buzzing began to keen in his ear, like an amp feeding back. He cocked his ear, waiting for the starting pistol. The finish line loomed ahead like a magnificent promise. Glory. Achievement. Winning. The crowd noise died down to a hush, but the keening in his ear grew to a roar. The chemical rush hit Jack Oriander like the hammer of Thor. Molten energy poured into his muscles and lightning exploded from in his brain. The signal pistol went off, and his legs answered as though they'd been waiting for this moment their entire life. They pushed him forward, shooting him off like a bullet down a rifle chamber. Suddenly he wasn't just Jack anymore. He could feel the atoms exploding in his sinews. He could feel a cosmic power gushing through his entire being. He was a god, and the crowd went crazy. The PA system rumbled with the announcer's astonishment. Unbelievable. Jack Oriander of the USA is literally burning up the track. His face had grown a rictus of determination and sweat burst from his brow and rivuleting globules. His feet seemed to have grown wings. The air rushed past him like a wild river the determination to win inside his breast burst into white-hot brilliance. The yard streamed by in a flash. Jack Oriander crossed over the finish line, well ahead of the others, his feet a blur, and his mind hot as an incandescent filament in a megawatt bulb. And Jack Oriander kept on going. The crowd in the stadium and the millions watching the race would never forget the close-ups. Jack Oriander's arms pumping, his legs slamming onto the turf outside the track like John Henry's sledgehammers his eyes gazing into madness. The young athlete from Iowa did not seem satisfied in shaving off a solid four seconds from the world record for the 100-yard dash. As though eager to get onto yet another race, unseen by any but him, he loped over the finish line, covering the distance between the edge of the track and the wall in a couple of blinks of the eye. Reason and sanity burned out in chemical conflagration in his cortex. He smashed through the corrugated plastic of the wall. Only the steel girder just beyond stopped his demented run. And the blood. The blood was everywhere. You can buy black market videos from media vultures. You can see the shreds of skin and veins and hair torn from the speeding body and hanging from the edges of the shattered plastic wall in clumps of gore. You can see the twisted remains of the rest of the body lying akimbo under the harsh glare like roadkill in a cleated tank run. And if you look closely in these vids, you can see the medic take something from Oriander's blood-spattered pouch belt and tuck it into his own pocket. Xenozip. The Oriander incident would be discussed sometime later at Quantico Marine Base in Virginia. Colonel Leon Marshall had requested the presence of one General Delmar Burroughs. The words urgent and maximum importance were used in his communication. This was a detail Burroughs made sure to immediately bring up upon meeting the colonel. The general's eyes turned stony. I hope that my time here is not misspent, he said. I'm not a man to waste time, you know that, said Colonel Marshall. General, do you recall that unfortunate incident last week with the Iowa boy at the Goodwill Games? Sure, put the world record in the American camp firmly, probably for years to come. Too bad about the accident. General, did you know that drugs were involved? Nonsense. Good American talent and muscle pulled that boy over the line. You didn't read the results of the autopsy? Oriander had Xenozip in his blood. Xenozip? Fire? What, that silly pick-me-up they're putting in the stores now? Marshall, he probably had caffeine and lots of good old-fashioned testosterone, too. Ain't nothing great about those pills. Hell, I tried a couple. Goosed me a bit is all, but with no crash and burn. Nothing that would make me win a race. That's exactly what everyone says, but I did a quick search of the news cuts for the last couple of months, and then I had the boys at Biochem do some quick testing, came up with some remarkable findings. I've got a team of science boy to read this stuff for me and I digest it. I don't get much out of it on my own, I'm afraid. That's all right, General. I have most of it explained to me. Just a few items of jargon, some facts and figures to illustrate the fact that I've done some serious work on this. Right, Colonel. I believe you, but I still don't see where you're coming from. You're aware of the active ingredient of fire, aren't you, General? Sure. The PR is that it's alien royal jelly. Actually, there's more to it than that. It's alien royal jelly with a drop or two of Queen Mother extra royal jelly. All that comes from one source, the Queen Mother who got nuked. Can't get anywhere else. 
A minuscule amount of this mixture acts in a positive boosting fashion on the human nervous system. Correct. However, even with a minuscule amount, Neofarm, the manufacturer, found itself running out of the regular jelly. They started manufacturing synthesized stuff with mixed results. It still needs a few molecules of Queen Mother Royal jelly to work, though. The general grinned. Right. I'm not surprised they're running out of jelly. We blew most of the bug bastards straight to hive hell. Absolutely, and we did a fine job of it, too. And a better job of reconstructing. But that leaves us, as the military, in a bit of a quandary, doesn't it? And I don't need to give you a sheet of facts and figures to prove it. The enemy is mostly defeated. All the governmental money is pouring into rebuilding or into outer space. Now that the military's done its job, it's the same old story. No respect. We get squat in the way of money to develop what we have to develop to stay modern. Public sentiment is also very anti-war machine. I think it's a historical distrust of power. The media tends to think that if the military has too much resources in a time of peace, they get antsy and try to take over the government. So the other extreme occurs. The military gets weak. And so when the country needs us, we get thrown into the fray unprepared and get clobbered. That's provable history, General. What can we do about it? We're not getting the funds to build new and improved equipment, so why not build a new and improved soldier? General Burroughs squinted suspiciously. What? Synthetics? Cybernetic? DNA jobs? That costs a pretty cred too, Marshall. Marshall smiled. How about if you could do it for just a few bucks a head, General? General Burroughs barked a growly laugh. Pull the other one, Colonel. Marshall checked his wrist chronometer. The players in the game would just be about ready. General, if you'd care to step out onto my balcony, there's a little demonstration I'd very much like to show you, courtesy of some of the men in my company. Burroughs shrugged. I'm here. I've listened to your curious nonsense, and I must say you must have used some of the government money I'm responsible for to throw together this bit of research. So I guess you've put me into a position where I don't have much of a choice in the matter. But let me tell you, Colonel. Better see some serious justification for the use of this taxpayer's money. Come on, General. Watch this. The two officers walked to the edge of the balcony. Marshall leaned against the railing and pointed down at the open yard below. Some yards away, a group of enlisted men seemed to be milling about, up to nothing much more than loitering. The General glowered. Looks like a bunch of men goofing off. If you'll just direct your view toward that lone private over there in the corner, sir. General Burroughs harumphed. Looks like just a normal grunt, and a mighty doofy one, come to think of it. Yes, there he was, the poor guy looking a little lost and oblivious, as usual. Gawky, geeky, big Adam's apple, tiny brain. That's Private Willie Pinnock, and, if I may say so, your assessment is right on the money. Private Pinnock barely made it through boot camp. His reflexes are slow. His IQ is low. He can barely handle latrine and KP duties, but he can, which is why he isn't booted. So, what's so special about this particular private? Just a moment, you'll see. Marshall opened up the walkie-talkie he'd taken with him. Corporal Glenn, can you read me? The walkie-talkie sputtered and spat back. Roger, I read you, Colonel. Marshall pointed to where the corporal was standing on a crate, snapped to attention, waving at them. Our referee if you will, General. He clicked the channel back on. Corporal, you may proceed with the exhibition. Yes, sir, spat the walkie-talkie. Pinnock's shoulders were slumped. He looked quite hesitant and more than a little frightened at the prospect before him. Nonetheless, he slipped his hand into the pocket of his fatigues and drew something out. Get a look at what he has in his hands, sir, suggested Marshall. A bottle of that drug. Xenozip. Yes, sir, that's right. Pinnock visibly drew a deep breath. He opened the bottle of fire, pulled out three tablets, then choked them down without the benefit of water. He stiffened and visibly shuddered. Doesn't look like he's having much fun, Colonel. No, sir. May I give you a brief personality profile? Pinnock is a meek fellow with a minimal aggression quotient. His adrenaline levels are low. He doesn't get mad when the other soldiers tease him. They generally just put up with him, since he tends to do the distasteful chores for them. With no resentment. None that is reported. 
Marshall looked at his chronometer. The increased dosage in the subject was his order to increase the speed of release of the chemicals in the bloodstream. The last thing he needed was an inpatient general. The results were going to have to be fairly immediate, or Burroughs would just about face and leave. A minute since ingestion. That would be about right. The colonel signaled the milling group of men. They loosely ordered themselves and began marching toward the lone private like a gaggle of surly teamsters headed for a manager. They were bulky lads, with rock muscles, earned by constant drilling and exercises. They had no weapons, only their fists. The frontmost of the group, a beefy tower of a man, stepped up to Pinnock, grabbed him by the shoulder and spun him around. A few obscene motions and words were made. Pinnock did nothing. Another man stepped forward and shoved the private. Pinnock shuffled backward, still not reacting, not even cringing, which was a good sign. Big Pex stepped forward, executed a sharp, swift push. Pinnock tumbled onto the ground. The smallest of the men, a little guy with a rat face, stepped in and gave a sneaky kick to the private's backside. What the hell is going on? said the general. This is absurd. Marshall tensed. There should be some reaction here by now. Something snapped. There was a scream, and Ratface was flung ass over elbows backward. He was slammed into the corrugated metal of a barracks wall and left a smear of blood as he poured onto the ground, out for the count. Three tablets of the synthesized version of fire, said Marshall. We did a genetic workup on the men, and Pinnock proved to be the most susceptible to the effects of the drug, Marshall explained. Of course, no one understands what the hell happens really, or what's likely to. Sometimes it appears to have no effect at all. Pinnock is a most suitable specimen, don't you think, sir? He's outnumbered, but what's happening to him? said the general. This is remarkable. Pinnock grabbed the first of the men with lightning speed and lifted him off his feet and hurled him back, knocking over five more army men. Glenn's voice erupted over the walkie-talkie, but the device was hardly necessary. Marshall could hear him yelling desperately down in the courtyard. Colonel, Pinnock's getting out of hand. Pinnock leapt onto the back of Big Pex and grabbed a hold of the man's neck. The crazed private gripped the head and wrenched, his tendon standing out from his neck. A loud snap. A pulse of arterial blood, and the big man wilted to the ground, his neck broken, his head almost torn from its mooring. The other soldiers watched this, stunned and stuck in indecision. The bloody demise of their fellow soldiers sent them racing away. He raced and tackled another, pummeling him into a pulp with his fists. The walkie-talkie spoke again. Colonel, he's out of control. We need armed soldiers out here. Oh my god, cried the general. Behind him. The crazed berserker that had been a meek private swung a powerful blow into Glenn's back, his bloodied fist emerging from the corporal's ribcage. Colonel Marshall did not pause long to watch. He was screaming into another radio channel for backup, armed backup. There'd been absolutely no indication that this exhibition would get this far out of control. Two soldiers, one with a machine gun, one with a blaster, raced into the courtyard. Somehow, in the sudden blur and explosion of fire and bullets, and despite a bullet wound and the loss of part of an arm, Pinnock managed to wrestle the machine gun away and use it on the backup soldiers, killing them instantly. Amid the decimation, Colonel Marshall watched with horror as the bleeding and burnt chemically charged maniac slowly swiveled around like a gladiator surveying his kill, and seeking out the Emperor, and not for approval. Christ, said General Burroughs, he's looking at us. A hail of bullets splattered over their heads. Marshall was stung with flying cement chips. The colonel ordered a strike from one of the soldiers armed with a bazooka, with an initially confused response. He insisted. I know those are my coordinates. Now fire the damn thing. There was a moment of silence, and then Pinnock climbed up the balcony toward them. Mother of God. Private Pinnock approached, smoking and smelling of burnt flesh, still grinning death glaring from his glowing eyes. The bazooka fired. The shell whooshed out of its pipe and whacked directly into the maniac private's chest, pushing him back to the balcony ledge before it detonated. The explosion of the shell blasted the private into pieces, not even leaving smoking boots behind. Marshall gasped and collapsed, dragging ragged breaths into his weary lungs. What a fiasco. A catastrophe of the First Order. Support from the General? He'd be lucky now if he didn't get his chops busted, didn't get demoted, or sent to deal with some alien infestation in northern Alaska. General Burroughs cautiously regarded the tattered gore. The remnants of Private Pinnock spread over the balcony like an explosion in a butcher shop. He smiled slowly. 
How much did you say this stuff costs? Military application of Xenozip had showed promise. At its current stage in supply, the drug was unable to deliver in the same way it once did in its earliest, purest form. In the absence of the royal jelly supply, synthetic elements were added to its development, often with unpredictable results becoming more and more apparent. The manufacturer, Neopharm, devoted untold man-hours to their research and development in mimicking the original ingredients. Its founder and CEO, Daniel Grant, the richest man in the world, would soon find himself with no choice but to lead an expedition to the source of these coveted ingredients. With a shared goal between military and private corporate interests, the voyage of the USS Razia would soon commence, and would find its crew in the midst of a brutal civil war on the alien homeworld. In this series, I'm recounting events taking place in the aftermath of the Earth War, as depicted in the Aliens comics and novels. For more on the events of the Earth War, please see the video playlist on the end screen and in the description below, and stay tuned for the latest videos. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, and be sure to subscribe for the latest videos from Alien Theory. A very special thanks goes out to Alisane, Queen Tier of the Patreon Hive. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.